Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for calling me in this debate. And I just want to make three really broad points about what has gone on over the last week. Um, I want to talk about uh, responsibility. I want to talk about this place's responsibility towards those who serve. I want to talk about our Afghan friends and our Afghan partners. And I also want to speak to and for, if I can, a number of veterans of that conflict who I've spoken to over the last week. Um, when it comes to responsibility, can I just urge ministers to be very careful around talking exclusively about the Americans? We are very clear, and it is well understood, that they are the framework nation or were the framework nation in Afghanistan. But people who join the military from council estates in Plymouth, Newcastle, Stoke, Birmingham, they do not serve the American flag. They serve the British flag. Absolutely. They're proud to do so. Yeah. They do it at the behest of ministers in this place. And it dishonours their service to simply say the Americans have left, we are leaving. We do not spend £40 billion a year on a tier one military to be unable to go out the door without the Americans. And the taxpayer does not expect that. And I would urge ministers to take responsibility for the decisions they make, particularly when talking uh, with the families. I want to talk about our Afghan friends uh, and partners. And I'm pleased with the announcement today around refugees. Um, it's a good start. Okay, people can say people can talk numbers. They can say we want more, we want less. Okay, the reality is it's basic maths. Right, we are not going to get everyone out of Afghanistan who we promised to. Okay, so we can say we want more, we can say we want less. But the truth is as well, we have to be honest in this place. Okay, and campaigners have for many many years campaigned against this relocation scheme, the previous intimidation scheme, and said it wasn't good enough. Okay? And ministers in this House have made decisions that has made it harder for them to come. So whilst I welcome this uh, change today and our onward progression, let's not kid ourselves about what has happened in the past and treat those who are campaigning for these people who have no self-interest of their own with perhaps a little bit more respect than they currently get at the moment. But finally, uh, I do want to speak uh, to veterans and for veterans, if I can. And it's clear to me in the last few days, and Helper Heroes put out something yesterday, okay, we, these are new feelings. These are new feelings that we are not trained to deal with. We're not trained to lose, and we're not trained for ministers to, in a way, choose, choose to be defeated by the Taliban. Was it all for nothing? Of course it wasn't for nothing, okay? And we have to get away from this narrative. You know, for a period of time, whether we like it or not, for a period of time, okay, Afghans, the average age in Afghanistan, 18 years old, they will have experienced a freedom and privileges that we enjoy here, and no one will ever take that away from them. And that's incredibly important. And what are we here to do if it's not to be good, honourable people and fight for the oppressed, keep our families safe and live to a higher calling? And you did this over many years, in some of the hardest conditions, against as dark an enemy as this nation has ever faced. We often looked to our forefathers for inspiration. You emulated them. You did them proud, not in scale, but in the same amphitheatre. And you can be forever proud of what you did when the nation called. You played your role. You cannot control what is happening now. Remember that. What folk like me saw you do, the courage, the sacrifice, the humanity, it will never die. And it has defined us as human beings. You did that, nobody will ever take that away. I will never forget you. And every day the sun comes up, I will make sure this place and this country never forgets you and your sacrifice on the altar of this nation's continuing freedom. The government must now step up and support this group of bereaved families and veterans. We are going to see a bow wave of mental health challenges. We're not trained to cope with the feelings we have now. I've done everything I possibly could to support all the brilliant staff in the MOD, the Office of Veterans Affairs, the NHS who work tirelessly supporting veterans up and down this country. But I must say to the House, with a heavy heart, the Prime Minister has consistently failed to honour what he said he would do when he was trying to become Prime Minister. 
The Prime Minister must not wriggle out of his commitments on this issue. The Office of Veterans Affairs is nothing like it was designed to be, and he knows that. The paltry £5 million funding slashed after less than a year. The lack of staff, not even an office to work from. Even today, the brilliant start at the, staff at the Office of Veterans Affairs simply cannot cope with the scale of the demand. And whilst his predecessors may get away with a certain degree of ignorance in this space, I'm afraid, Prime Minister, you have no excuse on this issue. It is a political choice. The ambivalence needs to end. He needs to step up and listen to the charities, listen to veterans, not those you choose to employ around you, who do not believe veterans' issues are worth the political capital required. The nation cares. We will make this government care. The scale of this challenge in dealing with this Afghan generation is only just beginning. I would like to pay tribute to everybody who has spoken up in this debate, but particularly those who do not have a vested interest in Afghanistan and can see the inherent injustice of what is happening now. And thank you, Mr Speaker, for recalling uh, this House today. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It is a great pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Plymouth Moorview, as it was the Honourable Members for Bournemouth East and Plymouth and Tombridge and Malling, all who spoke with great eloquence. Like many honourable members, I'm sure I'm racked with a profound sadness at the catastrophe that we've seen unfolding in Afghanistan. Above all, it is an unspeakable tragedy for the people of that country, who after generations of conflict now live under a terrible cloud of fear and repression. Who could fail to be moved by the agonising scenes from Kabul airport just this week? How desperate must you have to be to want to cling on to the side of a moving aircraft? These past 20 years have been a struggle for peace. We tried to break the cycle of war, to give hope to women and girls. We tried to give the Afghans a different life, one of hope and one of opportunity. But the catastrophic failure of international political leadership and the brutality of the Taliban has snatched all of that away from them. The new administration in Kabul should know that they will be judged not by their words, but by their actions. The world is watching. Now, Mr Speaker, I also want to reflect on the service and the sacrifice of our brave servicemen and women, who throughout showed outstanding professionalism and courage. But as the Honourable Member for Plymouth Moorview said just a moment, ago, recent developments have hit them hard. They're grappling with the question about whether all of the effort, the sacrifice, was really worth it. They're again grieving for fallen comrades who didn't come home. But whatever the outcome is in Afghanistan, those men and women and their families should be proud of their service, and we must be proud of them. Now, many of us who served in Afghanistan have a deep bond of affection for the Afghan people, and I had the honour of serving alongside them in Helmand. We trained together, fought together, and in some cases we died together. They were our brothers in arms. But I shudder to think where those men are now. Many will be dead. Others, I know, now consider themselves to be dead men walking. Where were we in their hour of need? We were nowhere. Mm. And that is shameful. shameful. And it will have a very long lasting impact on Britain's reputation right around the world. I will give way to David Dennis. My honourable friend, fellow litigator, is, uh, is uh, absolutely right in his description of the, of the Afghan armed forces. Will he add to his comments uh, now? That, that many of them are more heroic and better soldiers than they're given credit for around the world. I'd be grateful to the right honourable gentleman, uh, as I always am. I completely agree with the point he made. It was particularly distasteful and dishonouring of President Biden to make reference to the lack of courage and commitment by those Afghan ser soldiers who've served with such bravery and distinction. I think we have to be pragmatic, and I think at this difficult point, 
we have to think about what our next move is going to be. And we should understand that the character of our country is defined for better or for worse by moments like this. We should also understand that we are facing a moral and humanitarian crisis of enormous proportions. And the response from the international community and from the British government needs to meet the magnitude of the moment. So, step up the statecraft, engage with international allies and alliances and with regional partners. And although it is a particularly bitter pill to have to swallow, we must engage diplomatically with the new regime in Kabul. It is in our cold-headed national interest to do so, because right now our armed forces are deployed on an operation to recover UK nationals and other entitled personnel. It's in their interests that we engage to try and ensure the safe passage of those wanting to leave. But we also know that many, many more will want to get out. And with our allies, we need to work to establish safe routes to get them to safety. We must show compassion and genuine generosity to refugees whilst accelerating and expanding the Arab scheme to support those who supported us. We also need to defend the hard-won progress over the past 20 years or so. Girls in school, women in parliament and, and in the judiciary. We must ensure that Afghanistan does not slide back to where it was pre-9-11. And then, when the dust settles, we need to look at what went wrong and learn the lessons of this failure. Why, despite all of the effort, we couldn't build an Afghan state free from corruption with the legitimacy and competence to balance the competing forces within that country, and what that now means for our foreign and defence policy in this country. Regardless of all of that, we must remain engaged. We must show leadership. We must use whatever influence we have to try and make things better. That's in our own national interest. It's in line with our values, and it's the right thing to do. We owe that to the people of Afghanistan, and we owe that to ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you can. Thank you, Mr. It has been said 